Welcome to the Tangible Hope Podcast. Today we'll be talking to Michael Shrad and George Warren Brown, Distinguished University Professor at Washington University in St. Louis, founding director of the Center for Social Development, and author of Assets and the Poor, the transformational book in which he dared to suggest poverty was more than a lack of income, but also a lack of wealth. In doing so, he laid the groundwork for a new approach to social welfare policy, an approach that included asset building for the poor. Asset interventions such as individual development accounts, children's savings accounts, and even baby bonds sprang out of this new approach to social welfare. As a testament to the overall impact that Michael has had, Time Magazine listed him as one of the 100 most influential people in the world. My name is Willie Elliott. I'm a professor at the University of Michigan, and my co-host is Melinda Lewis, a professor of practice at the University of Kansas. If you find this episode informative and want to be sure others hear it, please hit the like button and subscribe. Also, you can find the links to previous episodes and related materials in the description or show notes. All right. To start off today, I wanted to do something different. I wanted to start off by reading the online abstract from Assets in the Poor, which was written in 1991. This work proposes a new approach to a social policy that goes beyond simple income maintenance to foster individual initiative and self-sufficiency. It argues for an asset-based policy that would create a system of saving incentives through individual development accounts for specific purposes, such as college education, home ownership, self-employment, and retirement security. In this way, low-income Americans could gain the same opportunities that middle and upper income citizens have to plan ahead, set aside savings, and invest in a more secure future. So that was the abstract. So, Michael, I'm going to ask you two questions before you answer. Uh, the first is maybe you can start off by, you know, you giving a, the listeners a little background on why you wrote Assets in the Poor in the first place and kind of the context of the social welfare policy at the time, how economists thought about income and assets and those kinds of things. And then secondly, it strikes me uh, from having talked to you a lot over the years and having watched the field develop that your emphasis understandably, would be different if you wrote uh, the abstract for the book today. If this is the case, what has changed in how you, in how you think about uh, assets and the poor since having written your seminal book, uh, what would your emphasis today uh, be in the abstract? Thank you, Willie. Uh, and thank you, Belinda. It's great to be here talking with both of you. Um, uh, the audience should know that we've worked together for quite a long time. I mean, we're talking way over 20 years and maybe getting close to 30 years. And it's been a, it's been a great pleasure working with, with the two of you and with many other people over the years. It's, um, so I'm, I'm really happy to be here having this conversation today. And this is really, really a good starting point, Willie. Um, yeah, I wrote, uh, I wrote Assets in the Poor, uh, Largely, I was a I was a, a young uh, assistant professor when these ideas occurred to me. Um, well, not not so young, but I was an assistant professor. Um, and what I I was uh, I was I mean I'm a social worker and I identify strongly as a social worker. I'm really proud of social work. I think it's has a, a really important agenda in the world that uh, most of it unrealized yet. We have a lot to do, but, uh, but I think there's good work ahead. I think, I think social work is really fundamental for human, human society. We're going to have to figure out how to, how to adapt to the 21st century and so on. Um, so I'm a social worker. I'm teaching in the school of social work and uh, I'm, I noticed one of the things I, I, I actually I was working with a group of, of, of welfare moms in the in the community and talking to them about about being on welfare because nobody welfare doesn't have a very good reputation. It never has. Uh, the people participating in it don't think much of it either. Uh, it's you know, it's, it's problematic. But and one of the things that. I noticed in those conversations is that you women the women could never get anywhere 
there was nothing about the welfare program that was really helping them get from where they were to to where they needed to be. And one of those things was that they could never accumulate any resources. Um, it was they they were poor anyway, but it was there were also rules against accumulating resources, or else you lose your welfare benefits. So, it they're just they were they were kind of stuck. So I was having those conversations, and then I'm a I'm a I'm a junior professor. I had never really had any assets in my life either. I'd worked my way through school uh, pretty much the whole and, and I mean, I pretty I paid I paid for college and I did it by having jobs and so on. I never had had resources and I I took loans to go to graduate school. So I I was you know I had student loans. My wife had student loans. We had babies. We couldn't you know we could barely buy groceries. I mean, it, but you know, we didn't, we just didn't have anything. Um, I, you know, now I'm really comfortable. Of course, I've been a professor all these years, but, but, but then uh, not so much. And I went to, uh, I, uh, but they, they set you up when you, you know, get a job like these jobs, they set you up with a retirement account and uh, you just sign something when you, and then, and then uh, money starts to accumulate. You don't, it's really important to make this point. You don't really save it. You've just signed something and then you're in a different system. The system is that some of your money gets taken out. The university puts some of their money in and that money goes into it, you know, taken care of by an asset manager in our case, TIAA, of course. Um, and then your money grows a little bit and they send you quarterly statements. So, I was getting quarterly statements showing, well, we have a few thousand dollars now. I'd never had a few thousand dollars. Um, and so, and then I'm talking with the welfare mothers and, and I, I just recognized it was obvious. Well, I'm in this system where somebody is building assets for me. And they're in a system where the rules are, you cannot accumulate assets. And so I, I basically just thought, well, why don't, why don't we do that for everybody? Why don't we structure asset accumulation for everybody? Now, this this actually also has a lot to there's there's this interacts with the, an important economic theory. The the standard way of thinking about asset accumulation in economics is that people are people are careful and prudent and you know spend less than they make and they and they accumulate some assets. It's it's about individual behaviors leading to asset accumulation. I could see that in my case, well, actually this dawned, this dawned on me because as a young faculty member, again, there was a meeting that was called and it was in Brown 100, both of you know that room. So it's, it's a lecture, big lecture room and the faculty would meet in Brown 100 uh, for, for things. And there was a meeting called for the faculty to, it was about your retirement accounts. And I said, and I had gotten these statements said I had a few thousand dollars. So I, I thought, well, maybe I should go to this meeting. And I walk in the room, the meeting was packed. I mean, the, all of Brown 100 was packed with faculty members. Now, I'd also been to university faculty meetings and no one goes to those. I mean, literally no one goes. I mean, a, you know, handful of ambitious people who want to, you know, hold office and that kind of thing, but nobody's there. But, but I went to this meeting, oh, well, talking about retirement accounts and it was packed with everybody. And I, and I thought, I thought, why are these people here? And they're here, they were there for the same reason I was, which is that somebody was accumulating assets for them. And that's the right way to say this. And then they thought they should pay attention. Now, that theoretical statement is exactly the opposite of the economic statement, which is people pay attention and behave well, and then they accumulate assets. This is really a fundamental point. So this gets down to how do assets accumulate? And for the most part, I, I continue to view that as an institutional matter, that the asset accumulation is largely structured for most people most of the time. And, and, and individual behavior is, it's important. It's not that it doesn't matter at all, but it's not the primary driver of most asset accumulation in most households. So that led me to write, to think about, start thinking about that. 
And I did think about it for several years and had a really helpful. I had, I got to the point where I had a sabbatical year coming up. And so we, we were in Mexico city that year for sabbatical. My wife was doing her dissertation research up in the mountains and I was managing the kids and think and thinking and, and thinking about what became assets and the poor. Um, so that's that's the story of that book. So that that's that's how all that happened, and then then we'll pick up on these themes later. But then then coming coming the, the, then you read this abstract, Willie. Very interest very interesting to me. Yeah, you're you're exactly right. So I picked up two key points when you were reading the abstract. One is that in the first sentence I used the word self sufficiency, and then the second one was there was a a, a talk about the strategy being savings incentives. Now, at this point, at this point, this was standard language at the time that we didn't really have a different way to talk. Um, well, this is this was like this was like, you know, the way people talk at this point. If anybody in, in the CSD uses the term self-sufficiency, you know, I have a talk with them about why that, we don't use that word or that term. Right. Because and, and that reasoning is that social policy and supports are so prevalent and such a big part of, of, of the economy, really. I mean, social policy is more than half of the U.S. federal budget. It, it, and basically, and if you include the tax system in there about who gets tax benefits, and, and this, beca this became an analysis in Assets of the Poor, also, it's, it's, it's like people are, no one is self-sufficient. Uh, you know, maybe, maybe by this point, Elon Musk is self-sufficient, but the rest of us, the rest of us are, have all kinds of supports going on. And I'm, I'm old enough to collect social security now. And I can tell you, you know, it's very nice to have a social security check coming in every month that, you know, that takes care of me. Um, so I would say I would have a lot more emphasis on policy and and social structure that that builds assets and wealth and well-being and less emphasis on self-sufficiency and literally i do not tolerate using that phrase anymore and the second one is savings incentives and there was no at the time it's hard to rem remember that at the time there was no other way to for me to talk about it i didn't but I would never use this language now. Um, we do, we do think savings incentives is important, and 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 we think individual savings behavior is important. But it's much more important that public policy support asset accumulation with large deposits, uh, and early in life, so these resources can build. And yes, savings should be should be promoted also, and 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 actually, and Willie's very very onto this issue right now that multiple flows of money into these accounts should be supported. Um, but savings incentives really not the main story. It's really about asset accumulation. So I will also edit out any time my staff talks about savings behavior and say what we're talking about is asset accumulation and the same thing. So. So I hope maybe that sets the stage for a pretty good discussion here today. Well, it, and I think it's just profoundly important for hopefully a lot of people watch this because I think even though I clearly knew this was a shit, wasn't how you would talk about this today, but, but I might even argue at the time it was relevant and important for economists to understand that low income people can in fact build assets. And one of the ways it was easy to, to, to uh, kind of test that was whether or not they could save, right? Because the institutional structures weren't in place in the way that they are today. They hadn't been developed like CSD has developed them. And so the kind of the easy, the, the, the most you know, direct and powerful way to do that was to look at whether or not low income people can be saved because economists didn't think they could. They didn't think they built any assets, right? And so, but 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 that also, I think, to, and and again, as we talked before we got online, these are logical steps, and necessary steps that were taken and language used at the time that was appropriate. Even though we've shifted now, 
I do think that, and I toss this to you, Michael, is, is that now in our conversation, people still want to hold the field to some of these basic ideas. And I would argue with the inassets on poor goes far beyond saving, ba- like all the, you know, you know that, right? I mean, like the foundations in, and, and even like with the, and I'll say this, I know you don't like this term, but so don't edit me out. It, <laughs> um, small dollar accounts, right? I mean, it wasn't the original vision wasn't that all accounts would have small dollars in them. It wasn't like, it wasn't like a, a point of emphasis that, that accounts should be small dollar and people should save their way to uh, prosperity, right? I mean, that's the way some people want to pin us into, but that was a practical choice because when we were starting, there wasn't foundations that were going to give us millions of dollars to throw into accounts. There wasn't states that were going to put money in accounts. There wasn't federal. So, So to test these ideas and get us off the ground, you made some really important decisions around testing individual development accounts and, you know, starting small dollar CSAs. But I also feel, and I'll shut up because I talk too much all the time, uh, is that it it not only has fueled, I, and I'm going to say it this way, and I don't mean this to be any kind of critique way, but it has hurt our conversation sometimes with baby bonds people because they, they focus on the savings and that initial thoughts which aren't where we're at now, not what CSAs are really about. But it also hurts the field of CSA sometimes because because we started off small dollar, it's hard for them to understand how this could be large dollar and why it might also be important to put real money in the accounts, right? And this is not fault of anyone, but now it's upon us to try to shift that mindset, help them to understand the origins of the original thoughts, understand what we've learned, infrastructure we have in place, and in, in why it's possible to go somewhere else, if you will. Yeah. I, so I, we're totally, with all I, totally, I totally agree about all of that. There are times there, and I've had these reflections. You've articulated this more constructively than I have, and I'm glad you're doing this. But I've, 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 I've thought more than once over the years, well, we should, we probably shouldn't have said it that way or, or, you know, that we should have, we should have made some things clear in in early on, but um, you can look at this. I mean, maybe maybe you know we weren't smart enough to do that. We didn't know, uh, or maybe maybe to some extent it was. It really didn't occur. It really didn't. These things didn't occur to me till we you know until we were in process doing the work, and then they then it starts to uh, starts to show up. Yeah, <laughs> I, I mean. <laughs> well, I mean, you're trying to really change a paradigm, right? And it has come up a few times in some of the conversations we've had even for this podcast. Um, the person we talked to from Canada about their um, educational asset building policies and how what they have incorporated in that and really the inspiration referenced assets in the port. She did not pull out her actual book with the actual like book darts in it, but probably that's because she was like, you know, at home and that's in her office or something. But I mean, clearly it's it has, has had impacts on so many of the developments we've seen, including in policy as well as in design. I, I just was thinking that, you know, a lot of this is about the process of changing paradigms and the journey to get from one way of thinking about what people living in poverty need to a fairly revolutionary alternative way of helping people build economic well-being. Um, and I guess it's not to me surprising or or bad that that leap didn't happen in one you know. Fell Let me swoop, read you something, but really is more of a uh, solution because okay. I think this is this is fitting. So it's on uh, page. I got it all bent over so I can't see one forty eight, and it says. Um, it's a, it's the section where 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 you're laying out the theory of asset building, kind of right, and you say as with uh, most new ideas. The major theoretical problem is not that no theory exists, but rather that various pieces of theory and evidence have not previously been put together in a way that illuminates the new idea, right? And so, what 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 you what you like? So when you go back and you say, "Well, you should have said it a different way" or whatever else, it's like we we couldn't, you couldn't, or the field couldn't see yet 
where we were going, right? And so what you were doing is taking together these different pieces of theories that existed and, and making them work. And then over time, we developed those and developed a language around them and, and are able to see things more differently. So so I think it's it's unfair for people to hold the field to those early statements as though they there was they can't change over time and it's but but in saying that the root of what was said in assets on the poor and i'm not saying this to post I, I take a lot of abuse quite frankly because people say i give you a little too much credit um and and so there's this thing but but what i've i mean i've done all this studying over these 20 years right 20 some years and i've come more and more to realize a lot of the new ideas that i'm thinking up are ideas that were in assets in the poor. And that's why the book is so marked up right now. Because, yeah, I'm adding a twist and I'm adding some flavor, some, some, some things to it. But really, foundationally, I cannot get past the idea or the fact, the reality, that what I'm thinking was already thought before. I'm just adding to it. Right? And that's what you were saying in that statement. That's why it's so powerful to me is that it's reality of my own life, right? My own research. Does that make me a clone of Michael? I, I don't think so. But at the same time, like the hard foundational truths were there and are there. And that's why I get frustrated sometimes with some of the, I talk about the origin stories and some of those things. I think some of these ideas have, have felt the need to so distance themselves from that early thought rather than recognizing how it has positively influenced and allowed us to get to where we think now. And that should be the frame, frame set. So we don't have to go back and apologize for language used then. That was the basis for us to get to where we're at now. And we shouldn't be held to that language as though it was somehow misused then. Hmm. Right? Does that make sense? I think it's really important. Yeah, I, yeah, I think it makes sense. I, I, do, I do. I appreciate that you, you give me credit probably the critics are right you you know it's uh, i deserve some credit a lot of people deserve some credit um, absolutely but, and trust me they I, write I, too and say give them credit <laughs> i do i do think and i will take credit for you know the 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 larger idea sets the context here which is that poor people also need to accumulate assets this and i can i think i can honestly say that this was not a discussion that, that there, there, there was no discussion like that. We didn't have language like that. There was no, nobody talking about asset building policy for poor people, uh, or or disadvantaged people, or uh -huh. you know, inclusive asset building policy. There was no the term asset based policy didn't exist. Uh, not, none of it existed. So uh -huh. that understanding, and this is just this is really just a, an accounting observation that. You know, paying attention to people's balance sheets is also important, even if they're poor, not 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 just their income statement, but their balance sheet. Mm -hmm. and, and it's really it's that other. Yeah. And yeah. and both of these are a critical part of finance. You, you have to pay attention to both. And I mean, this is a way I, I think everybody ought to take accounting uh, just just to get this structure in their head that that, that this is financial life has two main parts. But we weren't we weren't talking about poor people's assets uh, or their liabilities. We, that we, all we were talking about was some monthly income support or things like that, and how people needed to have a little mm -hmm. more of that. Mm -hmm. um, so I will I will take credit for for making that observation, which I think really then sets the stage for all the rest of it. And, and I was I would I would tell you we're just no we're like all these years from assets and the poor in. We're just getting to the point in concrete ways where we're starting to talk about income and assets defining poverty in the way out of poverty, right? It's not just income or just assets. And we, we're not even 100% there, but it is now, we see it in a randomized control trial in St. Paul and in Flint and some other places, right, where people are starting to combine these things. We're just really starting to take that in some kind of serious way. And again, that's not a critique of the asset field because the early efforts were to say that assets mattered because that wasn't even a thing. So we couldn't even get to the point of adding assets to income 
when in assets weren't even yeah. seen as separate from income. We first had to make that distinction and make that yeah. a factual thing. You did that through individual development accounts and through the American Dream demonstration and all that research, which heavily yeah. emphasized savings, to be huh. quite frank, right? Yeah. Not only, but it needed to, to show that these that poor people can build assets and assets are distinct from income. But now we're like going full circle and trying to say, well, well, now that we understand these two things add something separate and distinct, and so there needs to be policies for each, now we can start talking about building policies that combine them. And so that's a yeah. credit to you to, to, that we have gone through that journey and are finally getting to the point where we can have real conversations about that. I think I think I think that's right. There in the beginning, and and I was thinking very consciously writing assets in the poor that I I had to write this in a way that question that questioned whether in, income support was sufficient by itself, and doing that, I there there was a, there was a who I mean the 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 first re responses to assets in the poor from the income poverty people. I can imagine. I mean, they, they still, they still not, you know, mostly not, uh -huh. you know, thinking about this. Uh, and that's like 30 uh -huh. plus years ago. Uh, but the first reactions were, were, I mean, people uh -huh. were, people were, uh, you know, intent. I mean, I've got, I've still got, you know, scars on my shins from, uh, <laughs> it, it, it was, it was something, the, the biggest reaction the biggest reaction to the book was was not the conservatives who uh, who book basically ignored mostly ignored it, but mm -hmm. the 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 so called liberals mm -hmm. uh, who were who thought that they were you know taking care of all the poor people and they knew how to do it and and didn't want to be didn't want anybody to have a different idea about that. Oh, I yeah, and I want to jump in on that real quick. This is a good point. Sorry, sorry, man. Really? Sorry, what? Melinda, okay. I'm just being terrible. Okay. Uh, but but Michael got me all stoked up here. But no, this no, is a really I... important point as well. It's like, like, I, I think about Bernstein in 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 just this. In, in, he he wrote in one of his papers as in one of your books, and he talks about how it was almost unconscionable to ask poor people before we took care of income their income issues, what, you know, to think about saving. I, and I confront that in with like, so when we have the COVID, if you go out and talk to, to communities about, we, well, we can't think about assets right now because are we going to get, like, if you see a poor starving kid, I understand it. Like the first thing you think is they need to eat, but you don't think about the fact that like, I was a poor starving kid. You were low income as well. I mean, I was homeless for period, long periods of time. And and it wasn't just about the fact that I couldn't eat. What was really crippling was the fact that I had the thought that after, and I'm not talking like, oh, we're going to go experiment with poverty for a week. I'm talking about having, you know, 18, 20 some years of poverty. You, you begin to question whether or not the future can be different. And you have to be extremely delusional like I was. You know, I'm a half glass, I'm a, you know, half full glass person, like to, to a fault. And, and so to get out of that situation, right? Because otherwise, rationally, you're going to decide and look at your life and, and the facts around you that these institutions don't work for me. This society doesn't work for me. And, and, that's, and, and, and just feeding me for the day is not enough, right? I actually need something more to, to make life worth plowing through and to continue to fight for the American way and all these things. This is, this is, this is fundamental right this moment. Because not only are black people experiencing this, but middle class white people who are being squeezed, squeezed out of the middle class and who, who are frustrated with society are feeling it at this time. Like we have to, this is why what you've done and, and the fact that we're at this point where we can have a real conversation about it provides us with some hope. Like if you wouldn't have done all the things along the way that had to be done, and not just you, I understand that. I'm giving you Right. But but you set the groundwork for that. You set the, the for a place for us to begin to think about these things. We would have no hope at this moment. I'm being honest, because people at this moment need to have a policy that puts gives them hope, not just enough food to eat today. They they really need hope at this moment. 
Well, Senator Casey, um, with Ray's help, I'm sure, but um, the language that um, introduces his legislation in the Senate, the phrase I think really was um, income is something to live on and assets are something to live for, right? So this this idea that um, not only do people who are living in and near poverty need both, but in fact, policy can deliver both and income and assets aren't, you know, operating at each other's expense um, or somehow like compromising on either front, um, but can live together. What I'm interested in in hearing, truly both of you talk about a bit is, okay, if we have this, I think, more nuanced um, and perhaps more accurate understanding of the role that assets in the poor played in the start of what is mostly or should be seen as a um, unified, if not like in unison journey toward economic well-being for individuals and families. Like how close are we now and what needs to change specifically in children's asset policy in order for it to, you know, the way that you were just talking Michael, for for these accounts, this to be a system, an institution that can work for children and families the way that your um, you know university provided retirement plan worked for you. Like, how do we have that institution? Um, or if if we don't totally yet, what what is needed to happen in order to get that kind of infrastructure? Um, the way that you know I think we have as a nation been taking stock of our infrastructure needs on a lot of fronts um, in these um, last couple of years. I, I that's a that's a good question, and I can honestly I can honestly say when I was writing assets in the poor, I didn't understand this. I, I knew I knew that I was getting taken care of, but I. And I had this system taking care of me, but I wasn't thinking institutionally the way I learned to think along the way. Um, and so, I do think I do think we have to build a new institution. And I, you know, for I, I do I mean that basically a, a set of conditions that op operate for you know and can 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 do that function for for the whole society so that. So that everybody has something like you know that I, I walked into when I started employment asset accumulation. I I did I did have the presence of mind to writing assets in the poor to say this should start when kids are born. So that 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 was a that was also a, a, a new idea at the time. Um, but I didn't I I didn't think about what that institution would be proposed individual development accounts and I never I just didn't hadn't thought that through and I, and and what happened what happened actually was Margaret Clancy Margaret Clancy uh, who was in the in the finance community running 401k plans for a bank in St. Louis um, came back to graduate school in social work because she wanted to do wanted to have a more meaningful life and uh, you know she was very comfortable where she was um and making a lot more money than she was able to make after that but she wanted to do you know she wanted to do something and so and she enrolled in my class where i was talking about this book that i had just published and and she 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 she, she was interested of course and and she came up to me and said um how are you going to do this and i and 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 I had already learned a little bit about her background and I looked at her and I said, you're going to figure this out. And, and she did. The Margaret, Margaret knew that you could create savings plan structures like a 401k plan. And we began to think about that a lot more seriously. And in the early years, the first, the first proposals that we talked about were to take the federal thrift savings plan, which is a, which a government uh, savings plan structure for for retirement for federal workers. Uh, there there are reasons why we you know couldn't you know it, we were we were toying with the idea, asking questions, beginning to explore. We began to think about a four hundred one k plan for everybody uh, somehow that was operating in the private sector uh, in the way that four hundred one k plans operate. Um, and finally, we turned we turned to the state five twenty nine plans, which are which are publicly run. They're, the assets are managed in the private sector, but they're they're public policies, and and every state uh, except Wyoming has one. Uh, 
uh, and Wyoming, Wyoming, what has only about 600,000 people now, I think. So we'll have to do something about Wyoming, but we, we began to focus on, on the, on the 529 plan. Now this, 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 this decision is really important. Um, it's one thing to have an, to know that you need a savings plan structure, an institution. Uh, it's another one to think about, well, do we, this is, this is a key point. Do we want to build that from scratch or can we adapt something that's already in place? And we, we went with the latter uh, because every state has, has the asset managers are set up, the agreement, the process is set up, all of the, all the investment procedures and, you know, accumulation procedures and distribution procedures are set up. This is, this is, and, and actually not, not everybody understands this. This is a huge asset. You know, if you have to rebuild that, that, that I mean, that's, that's practically a non-starter in it because it, it, it's, it's a huge public investment. To, it's, it's a, it's a public good. The, these, these policies are public goods. The investments have been made in them. They work, they're efficient, they build assets. Um, and this, this people, it's hard for Americans to grasp that, uh, that social relationships and, and in this sense, formal social relationships as institutions have value that they are, that they actually are de delivering, uh, value. This is this that like this, this is why like people so easily don't believe in government. I believe in government. I mean, if we didn't have if we didn't have government, things would be you know, terrible. I mean, we wouldn't we wouldn't be able to do anything, and and you know the American uh, idea that you know individualism is the is the is the most important thing in the country is in my mind foolish. Uh, What's really important in human affairs is that people people learn how to work together and build institutions that make things happen that outlast individual behavior. There will there will be some exceptional individuals, and we should honor them. And sometimes they invent great things. But human, this is really this is the story. Humans are highly social animals. I mean, highly social, and that's how we have advanced. We haven't advanced because one or two of them was really smart and invented things. That is not, that is not the main story. The main story is that we have learned to work together and institutions in my view represent that when they're, when they're good, they're not always good. When they're good, they represent that, that, uh, really amazing cooperation among human beings. Well, and Willie, thank you. Willie, you you talk, though, about um, infrastructure and the idea of, you know, accounts as not being just or even primarily accounts, but really a, a conduit for investments coming from multiple streams, especially in some of your work over the past few years. I'm just wondering, like, how do you see those other elements of the evolving children account systems as getting closer to perhaps um, this idea of a, an institution? that can facilitate wealth building for low-income families and, and children, um, analogous to um, what we all, um, and in the book, Dr. Shradden talks about doing for him as a, you know, young um, professor. Like, how, how much, what in addition to the accounts themselves um, and the, the systems that facilitate those accounts, what else do we need? So I got to jump into some things Michael said, and I'll jump into some things you said. And um, I can try to figure out what my role yeah, is in this field sometimes. And uh, maybe it's mostly to uh, push Michael back to the future. I don't know if that's the right terminology, but, uh, but to go back to his original origin. So, so in the beginning, I already talked about how started off really thinking about savings and helping poor people as a way of demonstrating that poor people can build wealth. And I think then he went on a long journey, an important journey with the start of CDOK uh, in particular, individual development accounts at first, but then CDOK more so. And that sprang out of kind of our work around uh, the seed demonstration, which really was these 13 
small locality. And one of the big lessons I know just from having having mentoring sessions with Michael at the time that, that came out of there for him was that we need an institutional structure that really matters. And this is a way we're going to test this and these kind of things. And and I and I think that's been a profoundly important journey for the field to document, demonstrate what Margaret Clancy, everybody has done, that these institutions matter. I think the now going back part, and I think I've seen shifts in your thinking more towards this. It was your original thinking, so it's not like you didn't ever think this, but your emphasis has been different over the last several years for needed reasons, because we needed to say that these infrastructures matter and show how they mattered, but that the money matters in the accounts as well, right? And so we could go on a journey of small dollar accounts because we were trying to demonstrate. One of the first things you asked me to do, and I don't know if you remember this, was to kind of figure out how small dollar accounts work, right? Like, like how can a small amount of money in an account matter? And that's what made me start thinking about things like self-efficacy and blah, 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 and all these different things to kind of get on that journey and see how that would work. But my point is, is now like, I think we're at a point where we at least need to emphasize the importance of the money in the account along with the infrastructure. And I don't think it's needed for us to say one is more important than the other because it's like income and assets. There was a time at which we had to say assets were more important, right? To distinguish them. But now we're at a point where we need to make people recognize that income and assets are both needed. We need to make people recognize on the baby bonds, I'm gonna say it this way and I, I'm, I don't know where I'm going in life, so it doesn't matter. So uh, baby bonds people, uh, that movement, and I, and I value that movement. It's been tremendously important. And it's not the point of it, but they have to understand that the institutions matter, that the institutional structures matter. And I would tell you, I'd like to hopefully get a few minutes at the end here to also say that around Senator Casey's bill, I, I would rave a share of Senator Casey's team and all of them, and, and just all the people they brought in to build that bill. I think the changes they're saying to make to the five two nines are, are really relevant and important and would facilitate us being able to have a more cohesive conversation around baby bonds and CSAs because then, but understand that's back to the future because what, what, what has happened here? They're saying that, why do we focus on education as being the only thing? In part because we found this institutional structure that was focused on, on education, in part because of the polling we did, people said that education was a big thing, in part because places like Mott Foundation started emphasizing educational outcomes, right? And so, but it wasn't the original vision. And now we're at a point where we can, the we have enough understanding about income assets, institutional structures, money in the accounts to expand that use back again, or, or go back to where it's not only for education, but it's for these other things. And one of your arguments all the time about whether we use children's savings accounts or child development accounts, I've resisted that, not in point, because I think you're right. And I actually think when we get to making real policy, we'll call it something else altogether, right? But it was necessary, just like saying savings early on was necessary, it's necessary to say these things at this point, but that these will be long-term accounts that, that extend beyond uh, just money at college at 18, but money again, when they start to transition out of college so we can strengthen the return on the degree and so forth, right? And so, so we really, this journey has been one, let me, let me I'll, I'll be quiet after this. Wittgenstein's one of, I don't, I don't, he's one of my favorite philosophers. I don't even know why. I don't necessarily believe in relativism and these kind of things, but, 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 but his point here, what he talks about the groundlessness of our beliefs. First of all, we have to accept some things as true before we can doubt anything. And so when we're talking to people, we're fighting all these beliefs they have that they have no facts for. And so facts don't necessarily resonate for them because they don't even know why they believe it because they accept it as it's true because their parents told them. Secondly, he said, when you're really trying to carve apart what someone believes and why they believe it, they believe a whole set of propositions. It's not one proposition. When we go in, we fight one pro the, the, the proposition that seems most important, but there's all these other beliefs they have that allow them to believe that one thing that we have to address. And so what I'm saying is, I think the field has been on a journey of attacking all the different propositions to where we can get to the point 
of actually having the real conversation about having an institutional structure that um, puts real assets in it, that combines income and, right? But you couldn't just jump to that because of all these other beliefs. Lastly, and this really will be last, I will push against the idea that individuals don't matter. I think you're right in that the exceptional individual is not important, but just in journeying through life, I mean, think about your own, some people work harder than others. They really do. It just is. I mean, any, if you hire people, you figure that out real quick. And so there is an individual component to this. What we're fighting for is that there's not patterns of inequality. One more, one more last story is when I was a teacher at University of Pittsburgh, professor at University of Pittsburgh, a student, a Jewish student asked me, why do black people do so poorly when all these other groups come in and, and, and do really well? Uh, there's several reasons that relate to this. One is they were, you know, they weren't real people. They, they weren't allowed to own assets. They weren't all these things. When, when we sit down in class, we might hate the Jewish person, but we think they're smart. We think they can do business with a black person. We don't think any of those things. Right. And so my point is, is that um, we really have been on this long journey of attacking all these different, no, no, I got my point. I lost it. So I had to talk a little bit longer. My point was saying that example was that what we don't want to see is where we can easily and accurately predict that black people are going to do worse than white people, for example, or poor people are going to do worse than high income people. We want a system that allows them because the institutions are functioning right. It really does become about whether or not they put the effort in, they do the reading, they do whatever else they need to do along the way. Right now we don't have that system. And so people were, we can easily pattern them, see all these patterns where the same groups fall into the same problems and all the time, regardless of how hard they work. Okay, I, I I just I concur about all of that thinking. So um, yeah, I think I think that's right. You're 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 of course right that individual behavior does matter, um, but but you're emphasizing that setting up an institutional structure that at least creates a framework where people can have a chance and uh, be 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 on the playing field, and then some of them will do better than others always, but at least at least they aren't shut out from the, from the get-go, which basically basically you're saying happened to black people in America, which absolutely true, and still still shut out by and large. Um, in a lot of white people. I'm not, you know, I'm not just like, it, it's, yeah. I want to make sure that we're all inclusive here, right? It, but yeah, yes, you're, black people you're, are you're, different. You're good at that, but, I, and it's true, some white people are shut out, but, but race is a big, is a big issue in America. For I sure, mean, 100%. I mean, the, it, even, even more of a catastrophe really is what we did to native people here. I mean, if, if you could, if you could compare these catastrophes, um, you know, we, we have, you know, white, white colonialism has been a vicious thing on the planet and, and including, you know, in the United States. And, and we, we haven't come to grips with that fully yet, but it's, you know, it, it is definitely part of that picture. Let me say something else really controversial. I don't know that we, I think too much of our effort is trying to come to grips with that sometimes. And what I care more about at this point, because I really need my white brethren to be a part of the change. And they have to be part of the change. They have to understand that they also are excluded from these institutions, that they have as much to gain from institutions treating them fairly and treating other people fairly so that it really is a, because they've been, they've been given a lie, many of them, and they, they support it blindly. This whole thing about Wittgenstein again, about not having facts behind their beliefs. And so they fight to support these institutions that are actually destroying them and their families and not giving them real opportunities. And we need them to understand that. Um, yeah, this is yeah. really important. Okay, I, 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 I think you're right about that also. I'm, you know, I'm not, not debating that. Um. Can I 
ask a question that's a little bit, it's a little selfish to ask, but I really want to know, and I do think some other people do. Willie, you mentioned, you know, the children's savings account and child development account, and your language respectively differs on that. And what I'm interested in is why do each of you use the particular term that you do? Because not because I'm just like nitpicking on language, but because I do think that how we, the stories we tell about what these policies and the institutions they're trying to construct, what those the, what those stories tell it matters for then like captivating people's imagination about them. And I do think the phrases, you know, child development account and child savings account do tell a different story and, and kind of paint a different picture. Can you just briefly kind of give your elevator speech of why you use the phrase you do in your voluminous publication, um, respectively in this area, um, so that folks who are listening and noting that difference as well um, may have some Michael should a go first, into I think he's... your rationales. I actually agree with well, what, I... everything he says. I, I, I first proposed, and Assets in the Poor proposed a policy instrument called Individual Development Accounts. Um, so we could, that's, a, that's also a long story. Willie talked about it briefly. Um, I use a word, I, I, I was actually playing off individual retirement accounts, which already existed. And uh, I wanted to make the point that, well, this asset accumulation can be for more than retirement. It, it, has, it should be a lifelong thing. So that was... I wanted to play off of the language that existed, IRA language. Uh, I wanted to make the point that this should be lifelong. And really, mm -hmm. and, and, and I think, you know, I still view all the discussion about child accounts as a first step toward lifelong accounts. I don't, I'm not just thinking about getting through college. You know, Willie, mm -hmm. Willie talked about that. Mm -hmm. I never have thought that way. Mm -hmm. And I, and mm -hmm. I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to build a, a mm -hmm. Uh, an institution where everybody has lifelong asset building mm. um, globally. I mean, uh, this also doesn't have to be the U.S. So, so my my emphasis is, is on development for that for that purpose. And development is an overused word, and maybe not the best word. I think Willie's right. Whatever language comes along, will probably not be what we're using now. Um, but I think development, at least, it, it, it's, okay. it, it's a goal of what this policy is for. It's in the same way that individual retirement account, it's about retirement. It's not called an individual savings account for retirement. Mm -hmm. and, so I, and, and so I, I think, I think mm -hmm. keeping the eye on the goal of the policy mm -hmm. should be incorporated in the name. I also have come mm -hmm. to pretty strongly see mm. that when people say child savings account, then everybody wants to know how much they save. And that's, and we've talked about this at this time, that that should not yeah. be the main focus. So that's my rough. I think mine's a more complicated story because like I said, it's not that I don't agree Thank with you. everything Michael said. I just think there's realities in place that don't make it that simple. So for example, even when we started today off with the abstract, so when a person picks up assets from the poor and reads the abstract and then hopefully read some of the book and even read some of the solutions, uh, before they have digested all the other CSA stuff, had a chance to listen to this podcast or anything else, it will have been prescribed in their mind these ideas. And we can't, can't shake those. And so uh, I think too often liberals have made it their passion and goal to change words in, instead of trying to change narratives. So I talk to different programs. I got an email right now I got to answer before the end of the weekend because they got to talk to some, uh, some reporter and, they're, and, they're, and the reporter is still going to make it about savings, even though they call their program a baby bonds program, which is really a CSA program, but it doesn't really matter because none of this really matters. You're, like, you're getting lost. They want us to get lost in these discussions. What you have to be able to do is to quickly help them understand why savings is important and why it's a part of it, and then redirect them to what you, is that all that's taking place around CSAs that's important, right? And so I don't think it's as easy as saying children savings accounts or children development accounts, because that's already out there. And those who want to use it, I mean, I had this conversation with, with a reporter in St. Louis. I think he's a great guy, but in the end of the day, he has a set sense of 
a, a perspective of things. And even when you can shake him off of that, he's going back to that same thing because in the end of the day, that's what he wants to make the conversation about. Our job is to make sure that the conversation doesn't stay there, that we don't allow it to sit there. We have to, this is even when we get in trouble with behavior and institutions. We're so afraid of slippery slopes. If we allow any crack in our, or if we acknowledge at all that behavior has a role, we feel as it will become all about behavior. And the reason it becomes all about behavior is because we are afraid to engage in those conversations in the first place. We have to be able to not be afraid to get on the stage with these people and have a conversation about these things and, and, and don't allow them to take us down the path they want to take it down. Because in the end of the day, we do have facts on our side. In the end of the day, CSAs are about psychological development, health development, depression, right? These, all these different things we can point to that's about a CSA that's beyond the savings part. So yeah, I'm gonna acknowledge your savings part because if I don't, the person who just casually reads this is going to understand already that there's a saving component to this, that there is an individual component to this. Lastly, I will say that uh, I wanted to even talk about individual development accounts. Uh, and, uh, and I was to blame as much as anybody else for focusing on like the, the account in the child's name. And that is relevant and important. So we shouldn't diminish that. That's important so they get these extra psychological effects. But in the end of the day, the multiple streams part of this, these should be called community accounts. This is this is this is this is why it's not about individual savings. This is this is providing a structure. This is the beautiful thing and why I would say that we need to make these changes to the 529 program. Even if we can't get uh Casey's proposal fully passed right now, there is benefit to just making these changes to the 529 system so that the states can then build, I'm going to go to, to California to talk about baby bonds and CSAs. And, and if we had a structure in place where they could actually combine these things, I'd, I'd be in a much better spot to have this conversation, right? So my point only is to simply say that these really are community accounts. Now, I could go ahead and start calling them community accounts, but it won't remove the fact that I have to be able to have the conversation with people to take them from thinking about them only as individual accounts only focused on the individual and have to get them to the community level. It doesn't eliminate that work that has to be done. And so we just have to be engaged in that work at every moment and not allow ourselves to be not allowed to talk about the fact that individuals matter, that institutions matter, that, you know, it is a community effort, all these things. So blah, blah, blah. It's a hard task. We're, we're, this, this is a, as a, as a, as an add-on note to community accounts, that there was a period during the Clinton administration where I had proposed. We had a we created a group called the Growing Wealth Working Group and working with working with Clinton White House um, before before he I guess it was after he he endorsed IDAs, but he was trying to think about this. So I I suggested universal savings accounts, which Clinton actually used briefly uh, for for one proposal. It didn't really didn't really go anywhere. But that's the more that's the larger idea. And it happens to say USA, so it was a politically uh, you know a, a useful uh, phrase. Mm -hmm. But it, it does indicate right. that this is a this is a national project Catchy. and not not just an individual project. Yeah, a lot of our CSA programs don't think that way. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Melinda. So right. They, they they help they help perpetuate the focus no, okay. on saving a lot of times when you really talk to them because it's easy to measure it's it, and, and there's a lot of people pushing them on it and they don't know how to talk about it so they end up focusing on the savings piece as well and they're really missing out on the fact and they're not we've just started to innovate in the area of how do we get foundations to put money in these accounts how do we get employers put money in these, how do we, right, to make these truly a community investment. So 
Michael, I mean, this conversation has underscored what, you know, those of us who have worked around um, this issue have known for a long time, that you wrote a book in 1991 that has influenced policy and, and, you know, even more importantly, you know, actual experiences and outcomes for children and families, not only in, you know, Oklahoma and, and Indiana and um, in, in Canada, the places closer to us um, that um, read and, and have told us how influenced um, they were by your designs and, and your ideas, but truly on countries around the world. And 2024 is a crucial issue, not only here with a you know big election in November, but in many countries um, where the continual recovery from the um, cataclysms of 2020 um, are continuing to is continuing to uh, unfold, but you know where they have their own elections and um, you know social movements. I just would love for you to end our conversation this morning with what you see from this, um, not only looking back, but kind of looking from the top um, and a more global lens that is giving you some hope, hopefully somewhat tangible, but, you know, hope um, of that there um, can be um, continued and hopefully, like, pretty urgent um, movement um, to make these stars align um, at this point in um, this institutional development. It just seems like a lot of, and Willie and I have talked about this with some people, you know, that a lot is lining up for the the assets to come to accounts in these multiple streams and some potential convergence between baby bonds and uh, you know children's uh, savings interventions and some of the um, you know guaranteed income um, demonstrations. There's like a lot of stuff aligning, uh, and I just want to not only you know pause in this conversation and look at how much those alignments um, owe and we all owe to your publication in 1991, um, but then ask you to give us your, uh, from your perch of wisdom, your thoughts about like what, what gives you reason to hope that um, this year is going to be as big a deal um, as we hope it is. Okay. In, um, Somebody, I need to, of, I need to go open the front door. Case. Somebody's trying to get in. I'll be right. Give, give me 30 seconds. So I, I'll just say that um, uh, I'm really, well, we can just edit this out. So we'll just edit this part out. Yeah, the, if you just pause, then they'll be able to clip it out. No worries. I just, we were at an hour yeah, and one to, minute and so I, of recording and I was like, I should wrap this up. <laughs> and I do apologize. Yeah. Uh, I want to yeah. say that. I want to say that online. But. Yeah. Yeah. No. Okay. Uh, we have we, we have a guy fixing the back deck and he needed to get... No, yeah, we went a bit over, but Will, okay, Willie can okay, get that little um, okay. interruption so, just Okay, so you asked a really good question, so, like what yeah. the what the long term vision is, and, and and you know, I know I know Willie has uh, big big visions. We, a lot of us do, um, but th this is this is this is my thinking. I think I think uh, a couple of things. One, I think uh, that these I think that asset building will continue to develop as a policy. I think income support was really an industrial era response, a very effective one. And I, you know, I never speak against income support. I'm totally for it. But it's really uh, that idea is to provide some resources when people no longer have a job in an industrial labor market. Um, it will become increasingly the case. Uh, labor markets will change. Uh, some kind of asset building needs to take its place alongside income support. Uh, in, 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 all, in all households, and especially in poor households, because in, income from labor markets is, is more precarious all the time. It's, it, doesn't, it doesn't really get better, and it doesn't look like with, with advancements in technology that that's going to change. It, it just makes it worse. So I think, I think the asset building idea during, during this century will continue to develop. Uh, I think the long-term vision for that should be that there's everybody. It's a it's a it's a large structure system. It's system of accounts or one big account that's partitioned for different uses, and there's lots of variations for that. But 
it, it, I, I think various asset building policies will eventually merge and cooperate and that kind of thing. Um, this is like, I'm looking hundred years out here. Uh, so, um, but, but I think that's the future for that. I think also that we, we social policy is also defined, uh, defined by nation states. This, this is a, this is a, this also a, a product of, you know, the, the emergence of nation states out of, uh, you know, beginning before the enlightenment, but, but really, but really pushed by the enlightenment and, 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 and we, we, we developed a world that operates by nation states <coughs> and we have so, and social policy almost exclusively operates within nation states. So, we have U.S. policy. The Canadians have a policy. People in Bangladesh have a policy. There's there's overlap. There's some cooperation in in, reg in regions. The European Union has more cooperation. I think the long term picture for that is that we move more toward cross national policies and even some maybe someday glo global social policies. Uh, in that regard, I think a, 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 a key candidate for, for moving in that direction is, is child accounts. The, the world can get behind the idea of we have to develop all of our children. And, uh, and we have the technology now to do that. I mean, you can, you, we can deliver financial accounts to the poorest kid in some village in, in a, you know, Chad. Uh, or some country that, you know, doesn't have much resources. So I expect that that's going to happen. Uh, we're working, we're working on child accounts in a bunch of places around the world. Um, the, the two, the two most innovative ones right now for us is that we're, we're working in, um, in, in, a, in the post-Soviet region and Kazakhstan has announced it's going to take ha half of its oil money and start to open accounts for every kid. Uh, and they, they, they launched that this year in January. They haven't yet, you know, this is a small, I mean, you have to believe these things when they actually happen, but they, you know, they, they, they're pretty sure this is going to happen. We're in touch with people there all the time. It's pretty, we're pretty far along in a similar discussion with Azerbaijan, which also has lots of oil wealth. Um, and both of these countries are looking at this as they, these are countries that depend on oil wealth and uh, haven't done a good job of using that money to develop their population. This is a, actually a very common story in the, in the developing world. People, countries with natural resources basically don't do that well. I mean, I don't want to get off on that discussion, but in these cases, they intend to use a substantial part of their oil wealth as a as a as an energy transition because they they now see that that oil and gas is not going to support them indefinitely. Every, everybody knows that this is a we're we're at, we're in the end game of that, and so they they they're talking about using this wealth to develop all their children. Uh, and so we're connect, we're trying to connect with the climate change discussion uh, in, in that way. And I think that's an important, and it, hap it happens that the next uh, climate change meeting, COP29 is going to be in Baku, uh, in Az Az capital of Azerbaijan. And we, we intend to be at that meeting and talking about these ideas. And we're, 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 we work, we have a lot of relationships in Azerbaijan doing that. So that's, that's an interesting area. The other interesting thing now that that that, we're, that I'm working on this is really, I mean, there is a complete debacle happening in with, with Israel and Palestine. There is no, it it this is this it's 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 the most it's the most problematic part of the world right now. So much depends on what happens in that region. Uh, the Palestinians, of course, have been oppressed for, you know, at least the last hundred years and, and have been, you know, kicked off their land and basically, uh, you know, just treated, treated horribly. Uh, the, the Jews in the world also have been historically treated horribly and finally got a place where they thought they could, you know, have their state and 
but but at the moment this all looks just terribly sad for for everybody it it's not it's not going to come out well uh for anybody and so there's going to there there's going to have to be there's going to have to be significant international intervention in that part of the world we we have i had i had worked I had worked in Israel before we, so every, every kid and every Israeli kid has a, has an account, uh, including all the Arab Israelis and including, and I'm, I'm, I was, I'm really proud of this. It's a, it's a small point, but at little moments, you, you know, do something that's meaningful, including some of the Palestinian kids in East Jerusalem. These, I mean, these are not Israeli citizen kids and they're Palestinian and they also have accounts in, in in Jerusalem, so I'm I'm working now with with people in the region to try to open a discussion of a role for social policy in some kind of international solution. Um, the the discussions are all military or or political. You know, what's you know, is it going to be one state or two states or you know they're all about this uh, the way the <laughs> the way, you know, the people that run the world, this is what they think about military and, you know, politics and military and, 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 and trade. But I think that this is back to the point that people are so social and, and we have to solve social issues. The, the, the fundamental issue in that part of the world is that Palestinians and, and Israelis, the Jewish Israelis, Especially if we think about Israel being a Jewish state, that that they they don't trust they don't, they they cannot talk. I mean, they and and if they don't figure out how to talk or at least learn how to live together again, then nothing is going to work out. I don't think a two state solution is going to work out either. So I'm trying to talk about kids' accounts for all the kids in the region that helps to develop. Give, give some common purpose across across national boundaries and across religious boundaries and ethnic boundaries, however you want to think about it, that that all the kids in the region have to develop. Now that's a that's a that's a audacious idea. I don't know how we, we're going to get there, but I do think, and I and I think I think we who are social work. This is in my view. This is social work. And um, it requires work, <laughs> a, lot, a lot of work. Uh, it, I think we have to. I think we have to take hold of our what our subject matter and really assert what the value of it is. And we ha we haven't done that. You know, we we need to say there there has to be a social solution here. Mm -hmm. It requires it requires setting up some institutions that will do things so that people can get along a little bit better. Um. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and it, it really is a vision too for accounts for children's asset building as infrastructure, not only for their collective, individual or even collective economic well being, but truly as a tool yeah. to facilitate collective action in societies, even over, um, you know, really profound yeah. um, and traumatic and devastating divides. So um, it's, it, it is audacious, but um, we believe that we can do hard things and bold things um, with um, commitment to those core values uh, and a, a common, um, a common commitment to what we want for people. Willie, do you have, thank you, Michael. Millie, do you have any um, concluding comments um, before we I, I, I won't, but I would like to say that, uh, I just want to like thank Michael. I, I thought this was a really fun conversation. Hopefully as people watch it, they get to enjoy just the, the you know, just the conversation back and forth and, and, and get something from it that they can use to um, make a difference in their own lives and other people's lives. So, so hopefully we've added to that discussion and hopefully it was of some fun for people. I know it was fun for me, Michael. So thank you, Melinda and, and Michael for. 
it's really kind of a dream to get to know that I could, uh, you know, not only start my morning this morning, but really, um, you know, have this conversation be a part of this sequence, Willie, of uh, conversations that, that really are culminations of um, so much of your work and, and now my opportunity to kind of awesome. like peer so through the window. We have my my discussions. You got this. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, I'm ready. Yeah, I got it. I have notes, Willie. I wrote notes on a like neon yellow sticky note. So no, um, you know, particularly if folks came to um, the podcast for this episode specifically, um, seeing that Michael Sheradden was um, on the uh, marquee for this particular episode, um, and you want to be able to find more of them, um, not only those in the archives, but the ones that come up, um, then if you like and subscribe um, to the podcast itself, um, you can get get those delivered um, through whatever portal and, and platform you use to um, get to hear this one. So thank you again, Michael, so much for being with us this morning. Uh, and um, we will hope to cross paths um, in um, the thank you both this for, really uh, monumental year. Thank you for inviting me to, to have a conversation. Uh, I, I really beyond. enjoyed it also. And it's a, it's a, been a pleasure all these years to work with both of you. Um, really, really, uh, really terrific. Thank you.